Good morning. Would you stand and worship with us this morning? Good morning, church. Yeah. If you are here this morning, 
I want to remind you that you are attending the best and sweetest service in Lexington on a Sunday. How many people can testify to that? Yeah. This is the best service ever. You want to attend and enjoy service, come to second service at Broadway Baptist Church. Invite your friends. Amen? Yeah, and we are so excited to have each and everyone worship with us this morning. And um, we're in God's presence. And so we, I want to encourage us to relax, enjoy being in his presence. He is our father. And when kids are around their father, how are they? They are happy, excited, playing and jumping on his laps, right? And so um, while we worship, I want us to just stand up and walk to each other and just be nice. Amen? And be a blessing to somebody. Greet somebody. Talk to somebody this morning. Relax. Be happy. Be joyful. Let the peace of God sink deep in your heart. All right. Thank you for doing that. And we just want to remind you that if you are here for your very first time, please don't forget to um, fill in the connection cards that are behind the, our, our bulletins. Just fill in your information and the church will be able to get back with you just to know you better and not miss anyone out. Amen. So please, if you do not have it, you can raise your hand. The uh, people at the front desk can give it to you. All right. And when you fill it in, drop it in the offering plate when it passes in front of you, or you can drop it in in the black boxes at the Welcome Center. Well, thank you. And so if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and read a text and make a few comments by the grace of God, and then we'll be good to go. Uh, Luke chapter 8. I'll go from verse 43 to somewhere. Okay. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch. Someone did touch me said Jesus. I know that power has gone out, of, out from me. And when the woman saw that she was, and the woman, when the woman saw that she was, disco- she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared, she declared the reason she had touched him. And how she was instantly healed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it's easy to get lost in the crowd. It's easy to get get lost in the crowd. 
And from the story that I know that we must have heard several times, it is, it is strange to hear Jesus in that circumstances ask, who touched me? And even Peter was, was like taken aback. He was, you can't be asking that question, who touched me? Actually, people are pressing against you. People are touching you. Everybody around here must have had a touch of you. And you are asking, who touched me? And now that is what makes the difference between a purposeful touch or worship and a passive worship or passive encounter, a purposeful encounter and a passive encounter. We come to Jesus. We come to God all the time. And people have different experiences when they come to Jesus. Now, this woman did not just come to Jesus like all the other people came to Jesus. This woman came to Jesus with a purpose. She had a purpose. She had a need. She was intentional. She had an intention for coming to Jesus. She needed something from Jesus. She had tried to get it from other sources without any headway. And so her coming to Jesus was different from how all the other people came to Jesus. The other people probably came to spectate, to see, to discover, out of curiosity, to, to just feel their desire to see miracles or to just see this famous person that everyone had been talking about. But this woman came with the desire to go back with something. Even the disciples seemed like they themselves had just been caught up in the crowd. Because people touched Jesus and there was no effect in their lives. People encountered Jesus in that crowd and had no effect in their lives. But this woman encountered Jesus in a different way. And she had an effect. Instantly, she had a turnaround. She, something changed. There was a healing. There was a transformation. Something happened in her life when she met Jesus, when she encountered Jesus. Since we encountered Jesus. Since we heard about Jesus. Since we met him. What has changed? What is the effect that our encounter with Jesus has had in our lives? Or do we just come like one of those people in the crowd who will press against Jesus? And not have any effect in their lives? Or have we come this morning like the woman with the issue of blood? What is your issue? What, is, what are the issues we struggle with? Did we come this morning or do we go to him even in our own private times or personal times? Do we go to him with a purpose, with a desire? I mean with, with a purpose to get away with something? Or do we just do, do the crowd thing? Or do we just do the routine Sunday, Sunday to Sunday thing? <clears throat> How do you come? How do we approach Jesus? I believe we all have issues we can approach Jesus with every time and have an effect in our lives and in our families, just like this woman did. I don't want us, my encouragement to us is 
we should not come to Jesus the way the crowd came. We should not come to Jesus without any expectation, without hungering for something new, something special. Come to Jesus with your expectations, with your issues, and see what he does and see the effect it has in your life. The woman in our text is a testimony. And we can see that when you come to Jesus with a purpose, your expectations will not be cut short. Hallelujah. I want our attitude this morning to be a purposeful one. Let's worship him purposefully. Come to him with a purpose. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and worship him.
the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. Be seated. With, we're at this time of the service. We're now going to observe what we call the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is something here at our church we do six times a year. And here in, in uh, the Bible, it teaches there is two what we call ordinances we observe. If you remember last Sunday, we observed the ordinance of baptism. Baptism is a picture of your old life going under and your new life coming up. The Lord's Supper is for believers. So if you're saved, if you're a born-again believer... This is for you. What does Lord's Supper mean? Lord's Supper means we're identifying with Jesus' body. That's what the bread represents. And Jesus' blood. That's what the juice here represents. Because Jesus had this final meal with his disciples. And he told his disciples, he said, do this in remembrance of me. So when we take the Lord's Supper, we're remembering Jesus. So at this time, I'm going to invite our deacons to come forward. Jesus, my redeemer, there is no more for heaven not to give, and he is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace, till this 
Yes, I hope my hope is only Jesus, and for my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing all this mighty So oh, how strange and divine I can sing all this mighty yet not I but through Christ in me. The night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side the Savior, He will stay, and I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me, and through the deep this valley will be and all the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me I shall overcome the yet not I, but through Christ Thank you. in me. Amen. This is a, we've changed our Lord's Supper. We had the uh, prepackaged ones the past three years. So, as you see, this one here. Um, you lift up the first cup, and that's your juice. The second cup is your bread. So during the time of the Lord's Supper, what happened? We'll start with our bread. Jesus was this. He's in what we call the upper room with his disciples, and he's explaining to them that this meal they're participating in, this is the Passover meal. They're getting ready for their Passover, and this is around the time of Easter. So this is our Lord's Supper because we're four weeks away from Easter. This is our Lord's Supper we will have before Easter here at our church. And he picks up the piece of bread, and he explains to all the disciples there as they're having their meal, he's saying, this piece of bread, it represents my body. So he picks up the bread, and he prays over it. So let's pray over our bread. God, we thank you for this bread. We know this bread represents you. You said, I am the bread of life. And Lord, we cling to those words, because you have given us life. Because when we eat you, when we eat this bread... It represents we are saved, we identify with you, and Lord, I thank you for giving your life on a cross and then resurrecting, coming back to life on Sunday morning, on, on Easter morning. Lord, we thank you for this bread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After the bread, Jesus then picks up the cup. The cup represents Jesus' blood. In the Old Testament, the way the priests would do the sacrifices is an animal would be killed and the blood would spill over the altar. That was the Old Testament way of receiving forgiveness of your sins. The New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Jesus is the offering. So when he died on the cross on Good Friday, coming up, and then he was resurrected on Sunday morning. He's showing to the whole world, my blood has saved everyone, and I give new life. So that's why he told everybody that 
his disciples in the upper room, he says, this cup represents my blood. So we're going to bow our heads and pray over this cup. Lord, we thank you for this cup. It represents your blood. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Lord, for that, we are thankful for you. Thank you for dying on a cross. Thank you for saving us. Lord, there is a great cost involved in forgiveness. And Lord, you died so we could be saved. And Lord, we, we show our appreciation and thankfulness, eternal thankfulness, for what you did on a cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says that they, um, the disciples had a song. I think we have a song and an offering as well. So we're going to have our offering too, Beecher, after that. So we're going to continue. We have, I think, one more song. Then we'll pass our offer plates and give to the Lord. Deacons, y'all can, at this time, y'all can go back to your seats. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been Jesus now and ever is my plea. And all the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. And with every breath, say a quick prayer for us. Father God, we thank you uh, that we have the chance to worship you through giving. I pray that we have generous hearts and we are generous to the church. The church has so many great things going on from kids sports to uh, kids activities to missionary work. We do so many great things uh, through the church, but all those things takes funds and it takes generosity. So I just pray that uh, we are all generous to you and to the church in Jesus name.
Jesus, lover of my soul, and Jesus, I will never let you go. You're taking me from the miry clay. You set my feet up on the rock, and now I know and I love you. I need you And though my world may fall I'll never let you go You're my savior You're my closest friend And I will worship you Till the very end Jesus You're the lover of my soul Jesus, I will never let you go. You're taking me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know that I love you, that I need you, and though my world may fall. Never let you go, you're my savior, you're my closest friend, and I will worship you till the very end. Father, you are our closest friend. If we put our faith and hope in you and have that relationship with you, you can be closer than any, any person here on this earth. Uh, we thank you for Pastor Daniel. We pray for him and his message as he comes this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Bisha. Thank you so much, praise team, for that. Parents, we have children's church. Miss Sherry Oz, will you stand up and do your princess way? What we do here, parents, if we, we have children's church for about, what do you say, through third, fourth grade, we do not card children, but when mama decides their babies are old enough to sit in big church, they can. So you'll follow Miss Sherry downstairs right through here. You go downstairs to one of our rooms, room C1. And then afterwards, parents, if you want your children back, you'll go downstairs and pick them up when church is over. So all the children will follow Miss Sherry to Children's Church. Any other children? All right. For those of us here in Big Church, you want to open up your Bibles to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 14. We are four weeks away from Easter, and I'm going to be sharing and leading up to the, to the passages of Jesus being crucified and resurrected these next few Sundays. Always this time of the year, you need to be aware and you need to read the Easter story. And you better run. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, verses, we're going to start in verse 27. And then go to 31, and then we're going to flip down, and then we're going to look here in verse 41 and go to 52. So those are going to be our passages we're going to look at. And this passage here is about when the mob arrives for you. A mob showed up suddenly, and all of a sudden this mob changed the disciples who were at the they believed were a hundred percent committed to Jesus, all of a sudden they literally ran away and deserted him. And what the story about this is how quick someone changed. These men are with Jesus and they're ready to die for Jesus and then they quickly changed from ready to die for Jesus to being ashamed they even knew who Jesus was. And I share this is important for us because we live in a day, we live in among times where it's, it's easy right now at church to make a stand for Jesus, to come up here, sing a song, to give a testimony, to share a prayer request in Sunday school. But then all of a sudden, when you go out in the world and you're at school and you're at college and you're at work and you're, just, you're among other people who are not believers, then they will challenge you in your beliefs. They will mock you. They will criticize you. And all of a sudden, it's easy to just flop on your belief. 
you, were, you felt you were so committed, and then all of a sudden, you weren't. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to see how can we stay committed to Christ that when a mob shows up for us. Now remember, I don't think a mob is going to show up with swords and clubs like it did in Jesus' time. The mob for us is peer pressure. It's uh, mocking when you go to work. It's, it's going, uh, it's, when you're on a ball or sports team, all of a sudden your friends are um, doing one thing and that the whole group's doing this and you know it's wrong, it's immoral and you're not, you're not going to participate and, and they make cute, inappropriate comments about it. That's what a mob, it's this intense pressure to just conform and be like everyone else. And there is that desire among all of us here, we just want to fit in. We want to be like everybody else. No one wants to stand out. No one, you don't want to have a group of 30 people here and one, one little guy over here, one little gal over here. And, but I think what we're going to see here in our Bible, Jesus is going to tell us, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you need to be prepared to, in many ways, stand out. You're going to have to be prepared to stand for the Lord. So that's where we're at. So open your Bibles, or follow up along the screen. Mark chapter 14, verse 27. This is actually right after the Lord's Supper. Then Jesus said to them, he's, this is, they're sitting around, this is the after dinner meal. All of you will fall away because it is written, and this is Zechariah 13, 7, he's quoting, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep, the shepherd is Jesus, the sheep are us, people, his followers, and the sheep will be scattered. So he, letting them know, right after dinner, right after the Lord's Supper, all of you are going to abandon me. You're all going to fall away. You're all going to run off. And he quotes the scripture. But after I have risen, the risen, this, this meal is happening on Thursday night. Jesus is crucified on Friday. Jesus is resurrected on Sunday. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So Peter, who is a bold man who speaks up, he's the leader of disciples. He's the chairman of disciples. He runs the show. He says, Peter told him, even if everyone falls away, I will not. Peter's saying, these other 11 folks, they might not make it. They're not part of the 1% like me. They're just low producers. They're low performers in life. But I, Jesus, Peter, I will not be falling away. I'm a firm, strong man. That's what he's telling Jesus. So Jesus tells him in verse 30, Truly I tell you, Peter, today, on this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Not one time, three times he's going to deny him. That night he will fall away. And that's hard for Peter to believe. But he kept insisting, If I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And they all said the same thing. So now Peter is volunteering to die with Jesus. And all the disciples are saying, we're all going to die with Jesus. So you see a verbal commitment is incredibly strong. But the challenge is they're talking to God who knows the future. And Jesus knows they will fall away. Peter will deny him three times. All of these disciples who were at this upper room will soon abandon the Lord. So I want you to skip down now in your Bible, and we're going to pick up here in verse 41. I'll give you some background information on this. Jesus would teach and preach and do his ministry inside Jerusalem, inside the city gates. Well, outside the city gates, there was a hill called the Mount of Olives. And on that hill, there was a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. And apparently Jesus would regularly practice at night. He would get his disciples and get away from the people and kind of go out in the country a little bit and spend time in prayer and personal one-on-one teaching with his disciples. Because he knew he was in this intense time with, with all, of, all of them and dealing with all sorts of stuff in the city, uh, arguing with the Pharisees, and now we're going to get outside and get away. It's like, uh, I need a break from all the commotion of Jerusalem. So regularly he would do this. And that one night, 
So understand, this is a regular thing with his disciples. They just think we're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just another night. But it's not just another night. Jesus knows this is actually his last night with his disciples. This is it. And he's, he brings Peter, James, and John to their garden. But then they go deeper into the garden. He takes Peter, James, and John, and he tells them, I want y'all to really spend intense time in prayer. And just spend a lot of time in prayer. Well, if you, you and I all know, by the time 11, 12 o'clock rolls around, you're tired. It's easy to fall asleep. Well, these guys, they started sleeping. They're in a garden, so they just doze off. Found them, I guess, a rock, and they uh, just used a rock pillow and, and dozed off sleeping. And Jesus would come and check on them, and he would keep, he would kept finding them. Their eyes were heavy. They were closed. And he, at one point, says, can't you stay awake for me for one hour? Can you spend one hour in prayer? And the answer at this time was no. They couldn't spend one hour in prayer. And Jesus is over here, gone a little bit farther, and he is intensely in prayer because he knows we are coming to a close. And his leaders are sleeping on the job. So, in verse 41... We're going to pick up there in our Bibles. Why don't you follow along? Then he came a third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Here we are, three times. Enough. The time has come. See, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Jesus is saying, All right, guys, we've had enough time sleeping. It's now time for something to happen. So they're asleep. They're exhausted. They're tired. And being tired is just, that naturally happens when you go long periods of time, obviously without sleep, or you're staying up really late, or you got up really early in the morning. But Jesus understands this is it for him. So here comes the mob. And I think what was going on with the disciples, they were living in this life of routine. They had been to the Garden of Gethsemane. They had prayed with Jesus before. It was just another night. They envisioned Jesus was going to be this political hero, he, uh, hero who's going to take over the city. I mean, all the crowds loved him. The man could heal people, could raise them from the dead. What could go wrong? So they had this vision of he was going to go and push back against the Pharisees and push back against the Roman government. And these are, these are going to be our leaders right here. Peter, James, and John, the disciples, with Jesus as king. That's what they were thinking. But that's not what happened. While he was still speaking, all of a sudden, suddenly, one of the twelve suddenly arrived. Who was this person? It says, with him was a mob. There's our mob with swords and clubs and the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So the mob is a bunch of religious folks. The chief priests, the Pharisees, they all show up with swords and clubs. Why are they doing this in the middle of the night? Jesus would publicly teach in the temple. But because the crowds and the people loved him, and the Pharisees hated him, they needed to get rid of him quietly. Back in Bible times, they dressed differently than we dressed. I'm not, I've, I haven't watched Star Wars in a while, but if you watch Star Wars, you know it's like, I think it's Obi-Wan Kenobi. They wear these hoods over your head, and you can't hardly see who the folks are. That's what Jesus would look like in the dark and all his friends. So you would be walking around at night and people are wearing hoods and you don't really know. So I can't really identify who is that person because remember they didn't have flashlights and they didn't have electricity. You just flip the lights on. They're walking around carrying a torch. So if you didn't want someone to know who you were, all you had to do was put your torch up and put your Star Wars hoodie on and just walk around. Nobody knows who you are. You're just some man wandering around Jerusalem. You would have no clue. So Judas, one of the disciples, the, the money keeper, the financial secretary of the disciples, he approaches the Pharisees because he knew they wanted to get rid of him. and says, what will you give me to betray Jesus? That meant betray means you're going to find a location where no one is around, where we can quietly arrest Jesus and not make a big commotion. We want to get him in custody and not have all the crowds we want him in custody and make us look good. 
Like, I don't want to arrest them in public with me looking bad. We want to do it quietly. So, obviously, they knew, Judas knew his meeting place at the Garden of Gethsemane. So he took 30 silver coins and says, okay, I'll let you know when a good time is. And he knew he was going there. So Judas did that. He had participated. He was right there at the Lord's Supper. And then they, he knew they were going to go to the garden and pray. So at that time, he left the Lord's Supper, went and found the Pharisees. All right, grab your clubs and swords. Let's get ready to go sneak up on them while they're praying. And that's what he did. And it says here in verse 44, His betrayer had given them a signal. The one I kiss, he said, is he is the one. Arrest him and take him away under guard. So when they came immediately and went up to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him, they took hold of him and arrested him. One of those who stood by drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. And we know that was Peter who did that. And John's account says he restored. Jesus healed him right there, his ear. His name was Malchus, the man who lost his ear. Jesus said to them, have, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Like, I've been in the temple every day teaching, and you've come out with this army of swords and clubs to arrest me? Every day I was among you, teaching in the temple, and you didn't arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. What are the scriptures he's talking about? Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that Jesus will be turned over and betrayed as a criminal. It's a prophetic passage saying this is going to happen. But So when he said the scriptures must be pr- fulfilled, he's talking to the religious leaders who were right there. They heard what, they knew this, their Bible. They didn't realize they were actually the ones Isaiah, 900 years early, were writing about. It was about them arresting Jesus. So what we see here, Jesus is now under arrest. The disciples are realizing suddenly this really happened. These were the same men who promised that they would die for Jesus, that they would never deny Jesus, they would never leave him, they would never abandon him, and yet here they are. Now look at these last two verses here. Last three verses. These are our main verses we're going to look at this morning. Then they all deserted him and ran away. Just like that, the same men who literally hours earlier at the Lord's Supper, after the Lord's Supper, are promising death allegiance to Jesus, are gone. Now a certain young man, wearing nothing but a linen cloth, was following him. Who is likely this? We've got one guy they're going to highlight. Who is this person? Most likely this is Mark. And the reason why he didn't want to name himself is he's about to be embarrassed of what he wrote. Because he realizes he's the author. He's writing this book, so he's talking about himself. So he's saying, this is me. This is, this, I know this certain young man, and I knew what he was wearing because it was me. They caught hold of him. So they're all starting to grab away. Jesus is now under arrest. They grab Mark, the other disciples, Peter, James, and John. They bolt away, but they got this one young guy. He was maybe a little slow. So they grab Mark. And it says here, they called hold of him, but he left his linen cloth. So he, had a, he apparently didn't come dressed appropriate. He just had a linen cloth on, and it was like breakaway clothes. If you were, Back in the old days, they had these uh, breakaway pants. They'd just fly off. You could just, they snapped on the side, and they could fly off. He had this breakaway linen cloth, so he grabs the linen cloth, and next thing you know, his clothes just, you know, he, he ran out of his clothes. And he had no clothes on. It says he left his linen cloth behind and ran away naked. I mean, you just see how intense they are a, 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 a eager to get away from Jesus. Mark is running away with no clothes on. I mean, you see how everyone is abandoning Jesus at this point. When Hours and minutes earlier, they were making a pledge that they would be 100% committed to Jesus. They are ready to die for Jesus, and now, just like that, they're not. And I think the principle for us is we always need to remember, temptation is always lurking at our door. You might feel safe and secure right now. You might be ready to stand for Jesus today, but tomorrow... Tuesday, there will be new challenges. There will be new things going on. 
new opportunities to abandon what Jesus wants you to do. And the principle for us is if we think we're in our own human strength, just like Peter did, that we're going to be able to stand for the Lord by ourselves, with our own strength, we are fooled. If Jesus' disciples desert Jesus, then it can happen to us. You know, in many ways, these guys are running on empty. It's like um, it's late at night and they're exhausted. And you know, they say, I listen to the Focus on the Family podcast, and they had a person on there recently that said uh, parents and couples and people should never make major decisions after 8 p.m. And the reason why, after 8 o'clock, you're tired and you're exhausted, and you should not be making life, life-altering decisions. You shouldn't be sending that email, sending that text on how you feel at 947 at night because you're going to regret it. Because in the morning, you'll feel differently. You'll be rested and you'll feel up to it. You know, that's why parents have uh, times they want their children back. They have curfews, and it's because they know good things don't happen at midnight, 1 and 2 in the morning. They just don't. People at 1.30 in the morning aren't making wise decisions. Like, where are people going at 1.30 in the morning? What, what are they up to? I mean, it's usually, not, it's usually not always the best things. Well, these guys, these disciples, they are exhausted and tired. And they're wanting to rest. And Jesus is telling them, guys, you just need to pray. You know, I think the example for us, if we're in the middle of the night and you're restless, you don't know what to do, Jesus tells us what to do at night. He just says, y'all just need to pray. Pray for one hour. In the middle of the night, 11, 30 at night, and you don't know what to do, you can't go to sleep, you just fall on your knees. Say, Lord, I'm just going to spend this time with you in prayer. And the Bible teaches us right here that our lives, if we're not careful, we will be making statements when we are running on empty. Because late at night, these guys were saying, Jesus, we will never abandon you. We're ready to die for you. But they did not know what they were talking about. It's kind of like when we go by, say you need to buy gas for your car. You'll go this afternoon and you'll go buy gas. You'll fill it up. You're not thinking about, in a week, you're going to be on E again. For some of you, in three days, how far you drive to work, you'll be back on E. Tuesday, you'll be having to buy gas, put another $50, $60 in your car to keep going. And when, but once you buy, fill it up at the t- gas station, you're full. You don't, you don't even think about three or four days down the road. You're thinking, I'm good to go. And then here you are four or five days later, and you're back down empty again. And the Bible's teaching us, if you're living for yourself, if you're running on something other than the Lord, you are going to run empty. And that's what these guys were living on. They were, de- they were trying to be dependent upon themselves, making wild statements when Jesus is saying no, uh, you're not praying, you can't rely upon yourself, and you will actually abandon me. You're all going to desert me. You know, a good way, if you've ever seen a trolley, it has one pole over above it, and it's attached to an electrical line, and it runs on electricity. We need to be more like a trolley. It never needs to stop. It never, needs, it never runs out of electricity. It just keeps on going. But some of us are like, we're, we're, we're cars, we, just, we fill up, we make it a few days, and we're empty again. And that's what these disciples were like. They were just tired. They were exhausted. And they needed to pray. That's how they needed to receive a refill from the Lord. They needed to be with God. And I think the principle for us, where is all this going to go? Jesus is telling us, if we ever get to the point spiritually where we feel like we are self-reliant upon ourselves, where we feel like, God, I can make it. I will make a stand for you. I will make the right decision. I will choose rightly. I will honor you with my life. We are in a dangerous predicament in our life. How? Because we will be just like the disciples, and all of a sudden, the mob will show up, and it comes suddenly. All of a sudden, things turn and twist, and next thing you know, you're denying. (coughs) You're denying and abandoning the Lord. You know, last thing I want to make a comparison about these two gardens. The first garden in the Bible is the Garden of Eden. It's in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. It's where the fall happened in Genesis chapter 3. God created that first garden. The Garden of Eden is where Adam 
first began. It is where life began. But you know what? In the Garden of Gethsemane, it's also where life began. Because Jesus surrendered himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was willing to be arrested so that we can be saved. The Garden of Eden, book of Genesis, Adam sinned. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ overcame sin. You see the difference of these two gardens. One represents death, the Garden of Eden, Gethsemane, where he's arrested. He's, he's, and the reason why he's arrested, he's going to the cross. He's going there so he can overcome sin. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and, and Eve too, they went and hid themselves after they sinned. They went and hid in the bushes and took fig leaves and sold, sewed around themselves to make some clothes. In the Garden of Gethsemane, instead of hiding himself, Jesus presents himself. He goes, here I am. Take me into custody. Why why didn't we just do this in front of everybody? Why don't we have to do this in the middle of the night, hiding in darkness with clubs and swords? No fight. He just presents himself as the offering while Adam and Eve are hiding themselves. In In the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis, the Word of God was neglected. The Word of God was told to Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of the garden in the middle of the garden, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of that tree, you're going to die. So that was the command to Adam and Eve. It's neglected. In the garden of Gethsemane, the word of God is fulfilled. Do you see the difference between these two gardens? We look at this passage here, the garden of Gethsemane. We look at Jesus' arrest. We look at the change, how suddenly it occurs. And we are reminded... If it can happen to disciples, if Peter can deny Jesus three times just in that same night, if Mark can run away with no clothes on, if, and the Bible says all the disciples abandon Jesus, if they'll do it, folks, we will do it. So how do we not do it? We stay completely committed, not to our own strength, not to think, you know what, I've, I'm a spiritually strong Christian. You know, whenever you meet another believer, and they feel very confident, and they make a comparison with another Christian, thinking, well, I read my Bible, and you don't. I spend time in prayer. I do this. That is a dangerous person to be around, because that self-confidence in yourself, that's what these disciples had. Pride destroys us spiritually. Pride is when we feel, God, I'm better than these other 11 disciples. They might not come to Sunday school, They might not go to church. They might not come on Wednesday night. They might not have a prayer journal. They might not be reading their Bible with the church throughout this year. But Lord, ding, 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 I do. That person, all of a sudden, it meets the mob. And it happens suddenly. Sin is always lurking at the door. If it's strong enough for Jesus to fall down three times in the Garden of Gethsemane and beg his other disciples, please, please pray that you don't yield to temptation. One of the great spirits, or one of the great statements Jesus made in verse 38, he says, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That means your desire can only go so far. Logic can only go so far because we are in the flesh. You're tired. At some point, you have to have the Lord to strengthen you. So when you go to school, when you go to college, when you go to work this week, and you are just tired and exhausted, at that moment, you have to realize, Lord, only you can get me through this. When you don't know what to say, say, Lord, I don't know what to say, but Lord, you do. I just surrender it to you. Because if you're going about on your own, you will be like these other disciples, and you will abandon the Lord. This morning, God's teaching us. We need to be rock solid in our commitment to Him. We don't want to be like these other disciples that all of a sudden drifted away and abandoned the Lord when they felt it would never happen to them. Be trying to invite our band to come on forward. We're about to have our invitation. You need to respond to the gospel this morning. Jesus Christ is calling you home. Some of you come to church in your own strength. You've been doing things in your own strength. You've been holding on to life, just trying to make it. Maybe you've made wise decisions financially. Maybe you're really smart in school. Maybe you've run a great business, whatever it is. And God's looking at you saying, you need to be careful because you might have the right spirit, but you, have, you are in a flesh. You're in your flesh is weak. 
Any of us can lose our temper at any time. Any of us can yield to temptation. Any of us can find ourselves just like these disciples, and we desert the Lord. If you need to get saved, if you need to be strengthened by the Lord, if you need to turn to the Lord this morning, myself and Zach Bauer, we stand down front. The way we close our worship services is with a public invitation. We stand down front. And you come take our hand and say, Pastor, I want to get saved. Or maybe some of you, some of you need to get baptized. I've spoken to you about it. We'll schedule our next baptism service in about two months. We had a great baptism service last week. We'll baptize you right here. Some of you need to make Broadway your church home. Say, we want to be in a Bible-believing church that loves and serves the Lord. This is your church for you and your family. So we're all going to stand together. Beecher's going to lead us in a song. Zach's going to be standing right here. I'm going to be standing right here. You come and respond to the gospel this morning. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken, Lord. I'm accepted. You were condemned, Jesus. I'm alive and well. The Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how could it be, Jesus? You might care and die for me. Amazing love, and I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken, Lord. And I'm accepted. You were condemned, my Jesus. I'm alive and well. The Spirit is within me because He died and rose again. Amazing love, how could it be that you might keep and die for? It's my joy to honor you with all that I do. I honor you. You, you are my King. Jesus, you, you are my King. Jesus, you. Jesus, you, you are my king. It's amazing love, amazing love. And how could it be, my Jesus? You might give and die for me. Amazing love, and I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you with all that I do. I honor you with all that I do. I honor you. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, we've had uh, some response uh, to the call this morning, and uh, there's some, I think they're getting family and things, so I'm going to give a, a few announcements uh, at this time. Uh, so uh, first up is our Easter egg hunt, so Easter weekend is approaching, and on April 8th, that's the day before Easter, we have our Easter egg hunt uh, right out here on our lawn, so we're going to have 
thousands and thousands of eggs uh, for many ages. So uh, we want to invite you, your families, you know, the community uh, to that event. Uh, you know, it's always a great event, much more than just the egg hunt. Uh, uh, Sherry and the children's ministry, they put on a great event. So uh, that is coming up very soon. So Easter weekend, um, always a big weekend, a lot going on, uh, uh, lots of opportunities for us to invite people and our neighbors, so I uh, want to invite you to that. Uh, if you want to get connected with that, help and serve in some way, uh, please reach out, let us know, let Sherry know, and uh, we would uh, love for you to be a part of that weekend. Uh, June uh, 19th through the 23rd is our VBS, so uh, you know if you want a, one of your children, grandchildren, uh, to be a part of that, get them signed up. Your neighbors, children, you know, get them, uh, let them know about it, and they can uh, begin to sign up for that. If you want to volunteer, there is always a space for volunteers. A couple of youth announcements. Uh, April the 14th, we have a youth girls uh, night at Main Event. Main Event opens soon. You guys have seen it, driving down New Circle. And we're going to have a night for our girls uh, in the youth ministry to go hang out there. $10, I'll have a great time. Uh, they'll be busy for three to four hours, uh, having a great time there, so want to invite uh, our girls to that. And then, of course, uh, youth camp, so that's June 12th through the 16th. Sign-ups are open, uh, limited space uh, on that, so um, we can't guarantee uh, past a certain point. So, uh, you know, if we have a lot of sign-ups, praise the Lord, but at some point, if it's so many, I'll have to call the camp and say, do you have any more room for us? And we cannot guarantee uh, that part. So sign up, don't delay for camp. Uh, we always have a great time. It looks like we're uh, about ready. So I think at this time, I'm going to hand it back. <clears throat> I'm going to hand it back over to Daniel uh, to make some introductions. Y'all come stand up here. You're hailing. Um, God's certainly been doing great things here at church. I'll explain. The reason why, whenever you join a church or become part of a church family, so I'm introducing y'all, our new members here. So the way we'll leave our service is uh, everyone will come by and shake their hand. It's really exciting. I want to introduce uh, two different families here. We have the Mize family. So this here is Trisha, and this is her, uh, her daughter, Haley. Haley is a kindergartner across the street at Garden Springs Elementary School. So she's been down in Children's Church with Miss Sherry. So we are so excited. They are coming from a local area church and moving their membership here. And uh, Haley's already been asking some questions about getting baptized and saved. So they're planting those gospel seeds. So that is so encouraging, Trisha and Haley. We're so excited for y'all being part of, of Broadway Baptist Church. If you are excited for the Mize family being part of our church, you join me in saying, Amen. Amen. We could clap. If y'all want to scoot down right over here next to Zach. All right, Cam and family, y'all come stand up here as well. This here is the Tama family, and they moved here from uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, what, a few months ago. So who knows where Fredericksburg, Virginia is? So it is. So we got about five or six folks. So that's uh, outside on the outer loop of Washington, D.C., uh, out there. They were, they're coming uh, from a church called Choice Baptist Church there in Fredericksburg. And um, this here is Nick, and this is Becca. And then this is Noah, and Noah's in the seventh grade, and he was at D-Now, so he uh, is already part of our youth group. And Halene, is that right? Did I pronounce it right? Halene, are you in fifth grade? Halene's a fifth grader. And then we also have here Amanda, and Amanda's in uh, kindergarten, right? Amanda's five years old and is kindergarten. So this, that is, this is the Tama family, and they're coming and transferring their membership, I believe, uh, Hallie, you've been baptized, and Noah, you've been baptized, so, okay, she has, okay, no, I was going to put you down for baptism already, so, well, when you get saved, you'll be able to get baptized, so, Noah's already uh, received believer's baptism, so exciting for their whole family, the Tama family, coming and joining our wonderful church, if you're excited for this family as well, coming to join our church, we join you saying, amen, amen, so, all right, I'm going to invite everyone to stand up. So we're about to conclude our service. Right when we're done, we have our receiving line. Laura, Miss Laura, do you mind coming standing down there with them as well? We always want to have uh, folks stand, stand with our new members. And uh, whenever you're done, don't want to run out the door. You want to come by and welcome both these families and give them a wonderful Broadway Baptist Church welcome. Remember tonight, we have I'm preaching evening worship at 6 o'clock. And then afterwards, we have our business meeting. If you're here and you need your business meeting packet, it's right here. It's right back there at the Welcome Center. So even if you can't make it tonight, you can stop by and pick up the business meeting packet and read all the things we're going to be talking about and seeing all about that. So we have a wonderful service today. And Beecher, I think we have a closing song. So.
Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life. I wanna be on it. It's a narrow road, but mercy's wide. You parted the waters. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen. 